On September 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. It marked the beginning of the Second World War. Yamamoto said, if Japan allies with Germany and Italy, we will surely be dragged into the war. He opposed the alliance with Germany and Italy. Because of his position, Yamamoto was targeted by an assassin. The minister of the Navy, Mitsumasa Yonai, worried about Yamamoto's stance. So he dispatched Yamamoto as commander-in-chief of the combined fleet. Ironically, history led Yamamoto, who insisted on avoiding war against the United States, to elaborate the plan of operations to fight the U.S. as commander-in-chief of the combined fleet. Early in the morning on November 26, 1941, Vice Admiral Chiwichi Nagumo and his first air fleet quietly left Iturup Island for the North Pacific. The flagship was Akagi, and the fleet consisted of 31 ships heading south toward Hawaii. Radio communication was strictly prohibited. Before the fleet left, Yamamoto said, if negotiations between Japan and the U.S. are concluded, you must turn back and return to Japan. You must return even if you receive my order after the Air Corps have left the carriers to attack Pearl Harbor. It's not practically possible, Nagumo answered. Yamamoto was outraged and said, if any commanders in the fleet think they can't stop the mission and return to Japan if ordered, I will forbid their participation. Submit your resignation to me now. Nitakayama Nobore 1208. Climb Mount Nitaka 1208. At 4.30 a.m. local time on December 7, 1941, Nagumo's air fleet arrived at a point 230 nautical miles north of Oahu in Hawaii. The Air Corps were ordered to sortie. At 6 a.m., 183 aircraft of the first wave of attackers left Akagi and five other carriers for Pearl Harbor. And one hour later, at 7 a.m., 167 aircraft of the second wave of attackers took off. Even if we run a risk, we should start the war with the attack on Pearl Harbor, said Yamamoto. And his plan was executed despite the Naval Command Division's opposition. Yamamoto wanted a limited war and hoped to conclude a peace treaty after inflicting serious damage on the U.S. A total of 350 aircraft attacked in two waves, and eight battleships of the U.S. Pacific Fleet were sunk or seriously damaged. Ten other ships and 200 aircraft were destroyed. Losses to the Japanese Air Fleet were 29 aircraft. It was a runaway victory. But three aircraft carriers were out at sea and were not attacked. Yamamoto heard about the victory at Pearl Harbor in the battleship Nagato. Staff officers were delighted, but Yamamoto alone remained sullen. Because the ultimatum, the thing he had feared most, had been delayed, 
and the attack became an act of treachery as a result. The day after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Yamamoto commanded Combined Fleet Staff Officers to investigate plans for capturing Hawaii and Ceylon as second stage operations. But Naval Headquarters was not ready to plan for second stage operations because the plan, ambush and decrease, which they had worked on many years, was suddenly changed by the success of the attack on Pearl Harbor. This was the difference between the headquarters who tried to tackle the war by maintaining a long-term undefeated position and Yamamoto, who was certain that prolonging war would result in defeat because of the gap in national strength. Yamamoto could not afford to wait for the headquarters plan of operations. To the naval headquarters, he proposed one plan after another devised by the combined fleet headquarters. The Ceylon operation was to invade Ceylon in the Indian Ocean in alliance with Germany, which was advancing into the Middle East. On March 8th, this plan was officially shot down by the naval headquarters and the Imperial Army headquarters. On April 2nd, he proposed another plan of operation as follows. Late May, the Port Moresby invasion. Early June, the Midway invasion. Mid-July, the Fiji Samoa strike. Preparation for the Hawaii invasion targeted for October. The plans proposed by Yamamoto and others again received tremendous opposition from the naval headquarters, except for the Fiji Samoa strike. In particular, no one supported the Midway operation, saying it was hard to believe that U.S. aircraft carriers would fight over small islands such as Midway. They debated for over two days, but neither side would give in. Finally, Admiral Yamamoto claimed he would resign if this plan wasn't passed. That put an end to the debate. Yamamoto's plan of operation was approved by naval headquarters, though many of the officers were dissatisfied. Right after this event, a significant incident occurred which frightened the Imperial headquarters. On April 18th, B-25 bombers were dispatched from the aircraft carrier Hornet and headed for Tokyo under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle. This marked the first air raid on mainland Japan by B-25 bombers. This air raid on the mainland shook the Imperial headquarters to the core. All of a sudden, the naval headquarters, who were reluctant to proceed with the Midway operation, became aggressive. Yamamoto's goal was to lure out the enemy aircraft carrier units, which they missed at the attack on Pearl Harbor, and completely destroy them. But the naval headquarters added the invasion of the Aleutian Islands to their original plan to invade Midway Island. Furthermore, the Army, who had been acting perfectly unconcerned, decided to dispatch units to Midway and the Aleutians. As a result, the true goal of Yamamoto was gradually becoming distorted. It was shifting from the destruction of the enemy carrier fleet to the occupation of the islands. Nevertheless, Yamamoto and the combined fleet headquarters had no doubt about victory over Midway. Each unit was divided into ten groups and headed for Midway and the Aleutians. Yamamoto thought there were no enemy aircraft carriers near Midway. But if they attacked Midway, the enemy carrier fleet would respond. Nagumo's first carrier fleet would then crush the enemy aircraft carriers, which they missed on Pearl Harbor. The Japanese plan went straight into enemy hands. Based on the decrypted information, Nimitz planned to lie in ambush for the Nagumo carrier fleet. The 16th carrier fleet, led by Spruance, was accompanied by the aircraft carriers Enterprise and Hornet, and the 17th carrier fleet left Pearl Harbor. Two carrier fleets waited in ambush for the Nagumo carrier fleet at a point 320 nautical miles from Midway Island. However, Nimitz was not absolutely sure of their victory. 
He issued a command saying, if it is unlikely we will give great damage to the enemy, we should not expose any of our fleets. Nagumo's carrier fleet arrived at a point 240 nautical miles from Midway at 4.30 a.m. on June 4th. 108 aircraft left to attack Midway from four aircraft carriers. The other half of the carrier-based aircraft with torpedoes were on standby in preparation for the enemy fleets of the carrier-based aircraft. Nagumo firmly believed there were no enemy aircraft carriers in the surrounding sea, so his search mission using seven reconnaissance planes was very poorly done. The reconnaissance planes were not dispatched promptly, and some of them merely flew above the clouds without surveying the water surface. Nagumo's reconnaissance planes did not find any enemy fleets within 150 nautical miles. When the first attack unit, led by Lieutenant Joichi Tomonaka, was approaching over Midway, it was attacked by enemy fighters. But the Tomonago unit shot down many of the enemy fighters and all gathered over the base to drop bombs. The enemy aircraft had already retreated to the air and the bombing was in vain. Tomonaga reported to Nagumo that they needed to initiate the second attack. At that time, Nagumo's carrier fleet was under attack from B-26 bombers from Midway and carrier torpedo bombers. The enemy fighters with torpedoes were attacking at a low altitude, but Type Zero fighters were shooting them all down. Nagumo hesitated. The first air attack corps had demanded a second wave assault. On one hand, reconnaissance planes had no reports of encountering the enemy. Half the carrier planes were prepared for the appearance of enemy ships and were standing by with torpedoes loaded. Not long afterward, the carrier planes for the first assault would return. When they did, the crew would be busy refueling and re-equipping the planes, and the deck would be extremely crowded. Nagumo made his decision. The second wave attack should be carried out while the enemy could not be seen in the area. The first step of Nugumo's orders was to replace the torpedoes on the carrier planes with bombs designed for land. Thirteen minutes after the orders were given, Nugumo received notice from a reconnaissance plane. Ten vessels spotted, thought to be enemy vessels. Nagumo, basing his orders on the assumption of no enemy fleet in the area, jumped up in astonishment. The order was replaced by a new order. Prepare to attack the enemy fleet. Keep torpedo bombers in position. The change to orders caused great chaos on the ship. Eventually, another notice came in from the reconnaissance plane. One enemy carrier fleet spotted. Hearing this, Rear Admiral Tamon Yamaguchi of the 2nd Air Battle Unit sent Chief Nagumo a signal from the aircraft carrier Hiryu. Reason to believe a need to advance attack corps at once. This implies a request to send at least the 36 planes on the Hiryu and Soryu, and an urge for a decision from Nagumo. The Rear Admiral felt more than anything the need to forestall the enemy with an initial attack, then take over the battle. In an air battle, a quick decision could decide the outcome. However, Nagumo ignored this signal. He gave orders for the first wave midway attack unit to come in. After that, they would proceed to attack the enemy carrier fleet. With this command, chaos in the respective vessels reached a high. The bombers lined on the deck were quickly lowered to the hangar. In the skies above the carrier, coping with confusion, 
Attack planes from the enemy aircraft carrier were arriving one after another. A fierce battle heated up between these planes and the Type Zero fighters. The Zero fighters, superior in airborne performance and pilot skills, continued to shoot down enemy planes. While this desperate battle between enemy bombers and Zero fighters took place barely above the sea's surface, Catching them off guard, dive bombers from the Yorktown and Enterprise assaulted Kaga, Akagi, and Soryu from an altitude of 3,000 meters. The decks of the attacked carriers were covered with planes ready to take off, as well as bombs and torpedoes. Explosions set off other explosions, causing big fires on the decks. Only minutes after the attack started, three of the four prided aircraft carriers lost their ability to battle. Rear Admiral Yamaguchi of Hiryu, the lone vessel that was able to escape from the dive bombing, sent a notice. All planes taking off are to destroy enemy aircraft carrier. Eighteen bombers and six Zero fighters took off from the decks of Hiryu in the direction of the enemy carrier. Hiryu's attack unit located the Yorktown and attacked. Three bombs hit Yorktown's deck. However, due to furious anti-aircraft firing, the attack unit incurred considerable losses, including 16 of its aircraft. Commander Yamaguchi continued with persistent attacks, sending a second wave attack consisting of 16 planes. The unit hit Yorktown with two torpedoes, seriously damaging her. This result reflected Commander Yamaguchi's fiery fighting spirit, insistent on annihilating the enemy carrier fleet unit, even if doing so with the Hear You Alone. Lieutenant Tomonago, leader of the attack unit, was killed in this battle. He had repeated daring attacks against the enemy, even after his plane had been struck by enemy fire. Following this, an immobilized Yorktown was hit by torpedoes from submarine I-168 and would sink two days later. After the assault on Yorktown, the last remaining ship, Hear You, was met by a surprise attack by dive bombers, bombarded and destroyed. Commander Yamaguchi and Captain Kaku gathered the surviving crew members to the burning decks and issued orders. As commander, I will remain with the ship to take responsibility for the loss of Hiryu and Soryu. I order you all to leave the ship and prepare for future duties. All hands, disembark. The two then quietly returned to the bridge. The losses suffered by Japan in this sea battle were four aircraft carriers, one heavy cruiser, and 243 airplanes. Losses to the Americans amounted to one aircraft carrier, one destroyer, and 152 airplanes. It was an overwhelming victory for the Americans. At the beginning of 1942, there was no stopping Japan's progress. Japan was progressing at a rate that would see their supply line reach Australia any time. According to plans, they were to occupy Port Moresby, New Caledonia, and then Fiji. But with the sudden setback in their air combat powers, due to the Battle of Coral Sea, and then the Battle of Midway the following month, the Japanese were forced to abandon their occupation plans.
Instead, Japan decided to strengthen the defense of the Rabaul base and started constructing a number of base facilities. On May 2nd, they captured the strategic point Tulagi. And on the 4th, they began building an airport in Runga, Guadalcanal. However, on August 7th, the Allied forces recaptured Tulagi and Guadalcanal in a counterattack. No one at the Imperial headquarters anticipated this attack by the Allies, led by the U.S. forces, as a full-fledged counterattack. Only one man, Isoroko Yamamoto, saw this as a strike back and concluded that the enemy would come with their carrier troops and all other forces they could accumulate. He couldn't have hoped for a better chance to hurt the enemy. From this point, the two sides would fight for about the next half year in an effort to capture Guadalcanal. Losing their aircraft carrier, Yamamoto's combined fleet lost much of their ability to maneuver. As if to make up for this, they commenced a plan in the dark of night. The night operations were one of the Japanese Navy's special tactics, and they had considerable training for it. Not expecting the attack, the U.S. Navy lost four anchored cruise ships. However, the Mikawa fleet's orders were to sink a convoy of transport ships carrying large resource supplies. Sinking the cruise ships did not mean they fulfilled their objectives. Furthermore, in order to fill the hole left by losing the aircraft carrier, Yamamoto utilized the base's air force. The main unit of Japan's flying corps was in Rabaul. The Zero fighters flew as far as possible to repeat daring attacks against the enemy at Guadalcanal. But it was 1,000 kilometers to Guadalcanal. Although the Zero fighter is known for its abilities to fly long distances, it could not fight the enemy for even 20 minutes. As a result, they could not obtain the anticipated results, and many aircraft were lost in the process. Then, it was the newly formed enemy air fleet who made the next move. It was just as Yamamoto predicted. Yamamoto sent out aircraft carriers Zwikaku and Shokaku. Attack corps were sent out from Zwikaku and Shokaku and attacked the Enterprise and Saratoga. They severely damaged the enemy ships but could not sink them submarines achieved better results. The I-19 caught up with the aircraft carrier Wasp and torpedoed it. Of the six torpedoes fired by the I-19, three hit the Wasp. The Wasp, which had been refueling, exploded and sank into the sea. On August 28, 1942, about 2,000 kilometers north of the Solomon battlegrounds, Yamamoto arrived at Truk Island with battleships Yamato and Musashi. Yamamoto gathered all his soldiers here. Contrary to the opinions of the military, Yamamoto singled out Guadalcanal as the most important location and began studying recovery plans. For Yamamoto and Nagumo, the fiercely fought South Pacific naval battle for Guadalcanal was also a chance to get even for Midway. The attack corps dispatched from Zwikaku and Shokaku assaulted the enemy carrier in three waves. They sank the Hornet and left the Enterprise heavily damaged. However, for the Japanese, Shokaku had also been damaged, losing about 40% of its planes. They also lost their best commander since Pearl Harbor and many pilots.
The damaged Rikaku and Shokaku returned inland and began rebuilding their carrier fleet. Meanwhile, having made emergency repairs at an advanced base, Enterprise had quickly returned to the battleground. It was actively attacking a convoy of Japanese Army transport ships. The differences in the emergency repair abilities of the two sides was an invisible but significant factor in the outcome of the battle. The central battleground in this engagement was Guadalcanal Island. Realizing its importance, the military decided to move. In addition to battling the enemy troops, the combined fleet was ordered to take on the duties of transport ships. At the first naval battle of Solomon, fought under such conditions, Japan's specialty night operations were met by advanced radar firing that the enemy introduced for the first time. Japan incurred a crushing defeat. A combination of attrition and having lost command of the air over the sea made the transport ships the perfect prey for the enemy carriers. Overwhelming material superiority, coupled with the Imperial headquarters underestimating the enemy, Japan experienced unimaginable sacrifice and destruction at Guadalcanal. The Japanese troops finally abandoned the island in February 1943. After leaving Guadalcanal, the Imperial headquarters tried to halt the enemy attack at either the Solomon Archipelago or New Guinea. However, Yamamoto's plan was not only to give up New Guinea, but Rabaul as well, and shrink the extended front line, and build up impregnable defenses along the Marshall Islands from truck. He was committed to challenging the enemy to an air battle in an attempt to buy time so the strategy could be put in place. This was Project I. Yamamoto deferred his commanding post to Rabaul. Until the new defense line is in place, we must stop enemy attacks at all costs. Yamamoto greeted each crew member as they left. Watching Yamamoto see off the attack troops in his crisp white summer uniform, raised the spirits of the soldiers. Then, tragedy struck. On April 18, 1943, at the end of Project I, while on his way to Bougainville to observe the front line and to encourage the troops, the commander's plane was shot down by enemy fire. Admiral Isoruko Yamamoto, commander of the combined fleet, was killed in action at the age of 59. Following the death of Yamamoto, the command post of the combined fleet returned to Truck Island. But attacks from the enemy would not let up. And aside from Rabaul and the area surrounding the Japanese army base, forces continued to fall to the enemy. Admiral Miniichi Koga, Yamamoto's successor, declared, we will not leave our soldiers defending islands out there to die. If an enemy attacks, the combined fleet will be there to save you. However, counter to Koga's declaration, the South Pacific Islands continued to be taken over by the enemy. Not only that, but the enemy was pressing to the point 
where the combined fleet main base on truck could be assaulted from the air at any time. The following year, January 1944, an enemy reconnaissance plane flew over Truk. Truk was known as Japan's Pearl Harbor. Koga predicted a raid by the enemy on Truk anytime from mid to late March, but assault from enemy planes began one month earlier than expected. later, on February 22nd, Saipan and Guam were also raided. The combined fleet commander post, who had transferred from Truk to Palau, was forced to transfer again, this time to Davao. On March 31st, a Type 2 flying boat carrying Koga went missing after entering a fierce typhoon. Koga was killed on duty. Koga's successor was Admiral Soemu Toyoda. Unlike his predecessor, Koga, who tried to strengthen the defense, Chief Toyoda accepted the wishes of the Imperial Headquarters to go to sea and battle aggressively. On June 15th, the U.S. Army commenced plans to go ashore on Saipan. The distance from Saipan to Tokyo is 2,500 kilometers, short enough for a B-29 bomber to make an air raid. Saipan was a crucial location that the Japanese army could not afford to have taken over by the enemy. Toyota sent the entire combined fleet to Saipan. The main units the Yamato and Musashi battleships led at the forefront, with Vice Admiral Jizaburo Ozawa's carrier fleet following behind. It was the start of the fleet battle described by the Imperial Army. Ozawa raised the flag on the newly commissioned aircraft carrier Taihu and sailed out together with Zuikaku and Shokaku. On the flight deck were the Type Zero carrier fighters, and also the newly developed carrier bombers Suisse and carrier attack bombers Tenzan. It was the complete military air force of the combined fleet. Ozawa decided to take the outrange tactics for this plan. This strategy utilizes Japan's aircraft to their full potential. Japanese aircraft leave from an area American aircraft cannot reach and depart for an attack before the American fleet can find them. These tactics should have brought victory to the Japanese fleet. Ozawa and Imperial headquarters believe so. But when the first attack corps reached the U.S. air fleet, something unexpected happened. 475 fighters, more than twice as many as the Japanese aircraft, dived onto the Japanese core. American carrier fighters ambushed them. Carrier bomber Suisse and carrier attack bomber Tenzan's movements were extremely limited by the 250 kilogram bombs and 800 kilogram torpedoes. Many were young, ill-trained pilots who didn't know how to evade fire. For the Japanese who survived the American fighters' attacks and arrived over the U.S. fleet, a terrible new weapon, the VT fuse, was waiting. The VT fuse was an electronic weapon which exploded when it sensed the target's radio waves.
Though Ozawa believed he would be victorious, his outranged tactics ended in miserable defeat. The victory of the U.S. Navy was supported by the high-performance radar, which accurately located Ozawa's Air Corps, and also by the electronic weapon, the VT Fuse. The Japanese combined fleet lost about 200 precious aircraft out of 300. Moreover, the newest aircraft carriers, Taiho and Shokaku, along with many successful combat carriers in combat since Pearl Harbor, were lost to submarine attack. But Ozawa was still full of fight. On the next day, he organized the Air Corps with the rest of the aircraft and sent them to attack the American Air Fleet. But the Air Corps could not find them, and conversely, they were attacked by 150 American fighters. The Japanese combined fleet was obliterated. Yamato and Musashi left the front having achieved virtually nothing. There was only one fleet carrier, Tsukaku, left in the Japanese Navy. After the Battle of the Philippine Sea, Saipan, Tenyan, and Guam fell to the United States. The Japanese defense line moved back again. An American started landing operations in Leyte to regain the Philippines. On October 20th, 1944, a huge convoy of transport ships appeared in Leyte escorted by 18 aircraft carriers, six battleships, and 1,280 aircraft. After fierce bombardment from warships, air attacks and infantry landings were started. If Japan lost the Philippines, the sea lane would be cut off, and it would endanger Japan's main islands. The total number of aircraft, including those of the Navy and Army, was less than 100 in the Philippines. Even though the Japanese fleet would not get support from the aircraft, it had to charge into Leyte Bay. They planned to attack the landing crafts and landed infantry with all the rest of their ships. Commanders of the combined fleet ordered the operation Show One Go. The fleet had battleships Yamato, Musashi, and Nagato, and was commanded by Kurita. From the other route, two fleets were commanded by Nishimura and Shima. Three fleets in total tried to enter Leyte Bay. Ozawa's air fleet, which had only Tsukaku and three other escort carriers, tried to lure Halsey's huge American air fleet to the north to support Kurita's fleet charging into Leyte Bay. Ozawa knew that Japan had no resources to build any more air fleets. His only choice was to use the remaining aircraft carriers effectively. Kurita's fleet left Burney, made its way to the south of Mindoro, and entered the Sibuyan Sea. The battleship Musashi, which was called the Unsinkable, was hit by 20 torpedoes and 15 bombs and sunk. Even after the sinking of Musashi, Kurita's fleet kept on going to the south toward Leyte Bay, while Ozawa's fleet succeeded in luring Halsey's fleet. Ozawa's fleet was fiercely attacked by Halsey's Air Corps. Ozawa had only 13 fighters to protect his fleet. Halsey's Air Corps was attacked by hybrid battleship carriers Ise, Zwikaku, and two other aircraft carriers with bombs and torpedoes.
Ozawa's fleet carried out their mission at the sacrifice of their ships. But Kurita's fleet suddenly reversed course before entering Leyte Bay and left the front without attacking the landing crafts. Since the war, this mysterious return has been theorized by many people. In fact, there was not enough communication, which originated from distrust among the fleet commanders. In any case, Japanese fleets lost without giving any serious damage to the Americans. And the combined fleet had lost most of its ships. After this defeat, the tragic kamikaze attacks began. Pilots crashed into enemy ships. dusk on April 6, 1945, the battleship Yamato left for Okinawa. It was a sally to offer the Navy's tradition and glory to coming generations. Yamato was refueled for only a one-way trip to Okinawa. The next day, at 11 a.m. on April 7th, Yamato was attacked by 386 carrier aircraft. It was about 120 nautical miles from Bonomisaki of Kyushu Island. The Yamato was relentlessly bombed, but she did not sink from the air raid. Americans repeated the attack with 1,000 aircraft in total. Finally, the Yamato could not withstand it anymore. At 2.23 p.m., she sank. It was the last day of the combined fleet of the Imperial Japanese Navy.